Joining me now is fellow Canadian Dave Irwin. Most of you might know him as Dave Gets Social on TikTok, Twitter, and other platforms. He's a marketing strategist who hails from Leaf Country. What is especially impressive about Dave is that he seemingly reads a book every day and then he posts the review on TikTok. Welcome, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can probably tell from the accent. I'm Canadian now, but I wasn't always. Um, <laughs> originally from Ireland. So yeah, just I read a lot. I get through a lot of books and I do marketing. That's me. So dude, are you like a speed reader? Yeah, that's it. I don't sleep very often or all that much. So I read instead. That's it's so impressive too. I must. It's not really a book a day. It's about a book and it's about a book every day and a half. Cause I think yeah. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the 78th book of the year. So. Wow. I struggle getting through one book every month. <laughs> yeah, but you write books. So, true. you know, that's true. That's so. the, that's what I, I just read them. It's a passive thing. So, yeah. So other than books, what would you say your superpower is? Other than reading, hmm, superpower. I don't mind expressing an unpopular opinion. And then living in the silence that that unpopular opinion causes. I think that that's my, my superpower. For instance, you are in a meeting, let's say a marketing meeting, and you have to, let's say, be, most people would be tactful. I will not be tactful. I'll be like, that's a stupid idea. And this is why. And I'll just live in that silence. That's something that I think, and I get away with it. I think partially I get away with it because I'm a white dude. People just tend to sort of let that go. And that's kind of changing, which is a good thing. But also uh, the accent makes me a little bit more um, charming, at least this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> that's kind of fascinating, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what does your creative process look like? It begins with questions. It always has to start with a question. I want to find out what the goal is and the reason for completing something. So. This is really cliche, but as Simon Sinek said, find the why and uh, find the goal. And then when I know those two things, I can start to plan or get us to a point where we start making actual plans. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's kind of where it begins. Once I have all of that information, I will take it away and I'll write it all out in a strategy guide. This is generally just a one page marketing plan that will touch on all of the big jumps that we will make for whether that be the type of creative we're going to use. So video blogs, social media, stuff like that, as well as the people that we want to reach. So the personas, if I want to reach a female sports enthusiast in the middle of Canada, I will have a persona for that person will go about in creating that. And then it's all about whether this message will resonate with that individual. We try and name them, whether the messaging that we create resonates with them. Then it's all about just putting the, putting paint on the page, the creative part, the building of images, creating videos that all happens in the last 10% of the campaign. And we hit go and we test. That's my creative process. What are some of the marketing trends right now that you really love? I both love and hate this. I'm very cynical about marketing, but the thing about it is it works. I'm cynical about it, but it works. The thing that I love is influencer marketing when it's done right. So if you have an influencer and you are able to reach an audience through that influencer, an existing audience, the partnership has to be, has to align. It has to make sense. We take TikTok for a moment. Unbounce, which is these tiny little balls that you put in the washing machine. And I can't remember who, I think it's, I think it's Lenore or something is the company that owns them. It's a P and G company. 
there's a company that I'm terrified of, by the way. People are worried about big tech. Uh, right. People are worried about like Facebook and Google. No, I'm worried about P&G. Do you know how many brands they own? They're like the Disney of the... Of right? The, uh, yeah, they're everyone. Not they only own that, everything. they own like... <laughs> Yeah, everything. Anyway, that's a beside the point. They have this unbounced product and it just makes your clothes smell fresh. On TikTok, I'm seeing creatives who make comedy sketches make unbounced videos, <laughs> which is fine, but it doesn't sell me the product. I remember yeah. the video, not the product. The only reason I remember the product at all is because I thought that brand partnership doesn't really work doesn't make me want to buy this product. I don't remember anything. I remember the influencer before I remember the product, mm. which is a bad sign. You want your influencer to sell your product to an existing audience that will benefit from their insight on this product. It has to align. So in a way, they won my attention, but they won my attention for the wrong reason, which is this brand partnership doesn't really work. Why am I seeing this on my page? So when it works, I think it works well. For instance, if you see a friend of mine has, she's a national brand director of marketing for a pizza place in California, kind of all along the West coast of the United States, their national brand. They do some partnerships with influencers that are local to the cities that they exist in. They really work because because it's speaking to local influencers on platforms that uh, matter to those communities, whether that be uh, geotagged influencer style posts on Instagram or TikTok versus community building posts within the like local neighborhoods, either on Nextdoor or Facebook neighborhoods or whatever it is. I think when you get an influencer to align with your brand and it makes sense, it's definitely worthwhile. I, I do enjoy that type of, of marketing. It's not the style that I do, mm -hmm. but I like to see it when it happens because I think that really worked. I enjoyed this interaction. Um, maybe I'll go out and check out this product, which is what you want. What, what are the trends that make you cringe? <laughs> uh, so many. Uh, brands. <laughs> A couple anyway. <laughs> So brands trying to be personable by giving hot takes or personable <laughs> brands. We don't want our companies to, it started with, let's talk about the history of it for a second. It started with Wendy's and Wendy's hot takes where they were like firing back at people and firing back at other brands. When they started it, nobody else was doing it. It was an experiment and that experiment started to work. Now they're like a team of 20 people and they're really good at it. They should really be the only brand that's out there doing it. But we see a lot of brands trying to emulate that style because they think that that's what the buying audience wants, or they think social media impressions, which are just eyes on the actual tweet, TikTok, eyes on the piece of content is enough when it's not enough. You want a buying intent there. You want to be able to have an interaction that leaves a positive taste or a positive impression in your audience's mind. With these hot takes, sure, it gives a short laugh, but that's not, that doesn't scale. Yeah. It scales for nobody else except Wendy's. And the other thing that I find really frustrating is when a brand jumps on a celebrity's post and then it's just brands responding to each other. I know as someone who runs brands accounts, it's very often me responding to me, responding to my mate, responding to someone else at a brand. Then I see a brand that I don't know who works there and I respond to them. And it's just, it's teams of people responding to each other in this colloquial conversation that the customer is not actually a part of. I find that makes me cringe. It's it's happening a lot more and it leaves the customer out of the conversation. I, I just find that cringy. There, I've got a couple of questions that 
you see corporations that might not be digitally savvy that they might ask. So just kind of want to ask you how you might answer them. One would be the markets are changing and we're getting left behind. And we see this in retail every single day. The markets are changing or how the customer is shopping is changing and we're getting left behind somehow. Marketing is about finding a market and then selling to it, right? So the only reason that uh, marketing should exist, and, and this is taken from advertising, is that it takes the place of a salesperson when a salesperson can't be present or for interactions that a salesperson, a salesperson can never, will never ever be at. The way I think about it is if you're being left behind because the market is changing, you need to fundamentally change your business more than it is about changing your actual marketing messaging. Mm -hmm. If it's about things like, say you have all the infrastructure in place, you've got a new website, you've got the e-commerce, you have all of your social media and just things like Google Shopping, right? Having a Google Shopping account and having that linked to your Google AdWords. These are all infrastructure changes that you have to make first before you ever get to a marketing message. Because if the infrastructure is not there, no amount of marketing you do will be successful because you won't be able to measure it. And measuring is what matters. And that's actually a book by John Doerr. I just finished reading. It's excellent. It's about OKRs, which are a way of measuring goals and uh, how you reach them. I have a blog about it. The idea is that you have to have the infrastructure in place in order to reach these new markets. Now, if you have them and they are available to you, they're not super complicated to set up. It's just about the time it takes to learn them and get them set up. If you have them, you're still not being able to reach your audience or the audience is changing. Maybe you're going after Gen Z. They might seem like they have another language to you, but they don't necessarily, it's not that they have another language. It's that they want you to speak to them from that personal perspective, but without the cringe. What I would say there is be authentic. Talk about the benefits of your product, but keep your customer in mind. If you're trying to say, for instance, I'm an insurance company or I'm prudential, okay? The, just the, insur the car insurance for teens to mid twenties, like below, before 30. I am selling the idea that there is a pain point. What if you, what if you are a teenager and you get into a fender bender? How do I sell that to Gen Z? Well, you very, it's very easy. You take the situation, fender bender, you're a teen, you're worried about what your parents will think, you're worried about being able to make those, those insurance payments, then you just talk about the solution. Maybe you have an app, maybe you have some solution in place, that infrastructure that I mentioned, and you talk about the journey that that customer goes on from getting in the fender bender all the way to resolving the issue. We see this happen with both millennials, like people my age, and the conversation tends to happen around millennials. You see it all the way up to like an older generation who are, maybe their insurance has gone up because they're older. It's just about telling that story, focusing on the customer, and then mentioning how easy it is for them to resolve this issue with you. You can do it through a number of content, uh, sort of content styles, be it video, which you are already doing if you're insurance, you've just been doing it for TV. Now it's about editing that video so that it works on social. Yeah. Just hire an editor, they'll be able to help you out. The conversation points haven't changed. It's about the places that you put it in and the easiest way to reach those places is to have the infrastructure in place to be able to track your metrics as well as tell the stories that you've already been telling about your customers. That's, I hope that answered the question. I feel it yeah, was that's great. It does really come down to storytelling. Yeah. 
it does. And, and if you feel like you're being left behind, that's probably because you're not moving fast enough on the stories that you've already told. Just recut them. It's yeah. you're not reinventing the wheel. You're just or you're looking at it from the perspective of we're just putting it out there. We're just like yeah. throwing it out. We don't really listen to what comes back. Exactly. There, there's an old adage in advertising, which is to say half of my advertising works. So I just don't know which half. <laughs> well, with social media and digital marketing, you can tell which half is working. So get your infrastructure in place, have your systems that will give you that information. Then you can just measure what's working and what isn't. The thing about digital is you can move very fast for a lot less money than you used to, but it still costs money. Don't think of it as free media. Think of it like paid media, but cheaper than what you would have paid 10 years ago. Yeah. So this is a question, well, not a question, but a statement you would get. I don't know. You might still get it, but I used to hear if I had a dollar for every time I heard it, we tried Facebook once, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Especially if that's today, if they're like, we tried Facebook today and it didn't work, I'd say, yeah, hundred percent. It did. Of course it's not working. Facebook has hit a at least advertising in the West, so North America, Canada, certain parts of Europe, it's hit this level of uh, usage where that the cost to advertise versus the reach of that audience has uh, become saturated. The cost is only going up and the reach is only going down. That's true across all of the Facebook platforms outside of WhatsApp, which most people are not utilizing well their next platform the metaverse is not robust enough to be able to utilize from an advertising perspective for large brands or just as an experiment if you're a, a restaurant in ottawa you're not going to try and advertise on the metaverse because how many people in ottawa are utilizing that platform right it just doesn't make sense but there are other platforms you can use, other digital platforms that you can use that allow you to reach that audience. You just have to be able to sit down and ask or ascertain, I should say, whether or not your audience exists on that platform. So don't think about it as just Facebook. Facebook is just one social platform. Think about it. We have tried this. We've tried the local newspaper and it didn't work. Okay, well then what if a larger newspaper with a larger, broader audience? Or alternatively, we tried the national newspaper and it didn't work. Fine, we're a local restaurant in Ottawa. Maybe we need to go local with our advertising and, and try for community engagement as opposed to broadcasting a message out there. Because that is what it's about. It's about grabbing the attention of a community, speaking to that community. Let's talk about algorithms, speaking of Facebook and basically any platform. Could you explain algorithms in layman's term? You'll see a lot of people speak about an algorithm from the perspective of they personalize it. They personify it. The algorithm is not being, is not friendly towards this type of person or this opinion. And that isn't necessarily true. What an algorithm is a collection of topics, then those topics are shared with people that exist on the platform itself. If I've expressed interest in the band Metallica, the algorithm will know that I am into heavy metal and rock and roll, and therefore it might try and serve me something from Death Leopard, or it might serve me something from Ozzy Osbourne. And it's making a guess to see whether or not I'll interact with that content. If I have a positive interaction with it, so for instance, I hit a like on one of the posts, or alternatively, I have a negative interaction, which is to say I dismiss the notification without looking at it. Or there's, a, there's like thousands of these interactions that you have every day. You don't even think about it. it. It's from as little as spending half a second on a piece of content 
that is a positive interaction to scrolling past the content in less than half a second would be a negative interaction. You don't even notice that cognitively, like you don't notice you're doing it, but the algorithm logs that as a positive or a negative interaction. With that, they build this model of what they think you'll like. Then they'll just start slotting topics of, or topics, they should say, into that model to say, well, they've expressed interest in this type of content before. Let's serve them more of this. They'll stay on platform. They'll be happier. Maybe they'll even buy something from us. You do this enough and the algorithm gets very complicated. And then eventually you're scrolling through your Facebook or your Instagram and you're realizing, why am I getting the same ad four times? Mm -hmm. It's not actually the same ad. That's the other thing. It's different versions of that ad that a marketer like myself has created. And the algorithm has said, well, you've had a positive interaction about this first version. Let me serve you the second version again. And the unfortunate thing is there's so many people like me creating ads that are very similar to each other, that all cater to the same audience, that you will eventually start to see as you scroll the same thing, the same message over and over again. There's only so many ways you can sell a fish. So yeah. you start to see content that's a little bit ubiquitous. That's kind of what an algorithm is. Also, what happens when you see the same ad all the time, what you end up doing is that eventually hiding it <laughs> so you don't see yeah. it anymore. So it kind of... Exactly. You and, can't beat a and dead that, horse. <laughs> and the, the problem with that is that you've had so many what positive interactions with this type of content before that the weight of you hiding that one piece of content doesn't equate to what the algorithm would consider. Mm. It doesn't balance. You're still getting these, you're still getting this negative. You feel negative about it, but the algorithm doesn't know uh. because it's collected a thousand positive interactions. You've only provided it with one negative. You might not see it on Facebook, but then you're going to see it on Instagram and maybe Twitter. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. That is why I am cynical about marketing. We spread our messaging as far and as wide as we possibly can, hoping to reach the audience that we want to reach, which is the opposite of what my advice is. Find where your audience is and go and speak to them. And unfortunately at scale, that just doesn't work. You can't, if you are a national brand, like if I'm Tim Hortons, I can't do that, right? Because there's a Tim Hortons in every, in every town and I can't have an employee on social media in every town. So therefore, how do I reach that audience? The only way to do it is by spreading your message across every platform that you can, which is why I get advertisements for Tim Hortons sandwiches everywhere. Even though I don't eat in Tim Hortons ever. Are the algorithms determined by the corporation or the guy in charge of IT teams? Or does the corporation just say to the team, hey, I want this to do this, and then leaves it to the team to code it in the way that they want? So in a way, it's a bit of both. And that's not a very satisfying answer. <laughs> We know that Facebook manipulates their algorithm. They make up to, like, for instance, Google. We think about the algorithm from the perspective of what we see on Facebook and Instagram. But Google is the master of the algorithm. They make 500, something like five, was it 500 changes a day? And that was data from three years ago to their algorithm. When you think about it, that's way more important than the types of ads you get on social media, because it speaks to the ranking that you have when you type in a search term, right? Uh, what is my closest doctor? Well, they're making intraday changes to that result. The algorithm is in part, I wanted to do this. I wanted to serve this type of content to people. But we also know that Facebook has gotten in trouble for things like messing with the search, the sort of search results that will come up and 
providing bad data to advertisers, for instance, providing impressions that don't exist. And earlier on, I explained this impression was just eyeballs on a thing. Facebook got in trouble in 2017 for saying that their video platform was getting more impressions than it actually was. Mm -hmm. So advertisers were paying them more money than they actually should have earned based on the cost Maybe. per view or whatever <laughs> it is. So they got in trouble for that. They said, the, the answer to them was, oh, yeah, we've made a change. We'll never happen again. But they didn't provide any proof that they made that change. We're just supposed to take the word from it. So they do get in trouble for this quite a bit. We know that in a way, the algorithm gets so complicated that no one person would ever be able to say, make this change and have it so that this person view this ad from McDonald's, or this ad from Timmy's. At the same time, it's very easy to find a persona. Like I said earlier on, if I want to meet, if I want to reach female, older sports enthusiast in and around Alberta, how many of them are there? We can tailor our messaging so that it is very specific. And you can even do something like, I know how many Davids there are in Toronto. Okay, by doing a search on social media, I can tell how many Davids there are. How many Davids are from Europe in Toronto? Oh. Well, there's probably going to be less than 2,000. Fine. Let's speak to them. That's 2,000 people that I'm speaking to out of 7 million or something. You can get very specific and you can tailor your messaging so that it seems like it's personal. When it isn't really, it's just a bunch of data that they've gathered and they've put together in a pot and they've served a message to it. In a way, that is the person we're trying to reach. So if I wanted to reach you, I could put your name on the, the message itself. Even though I'm not necessarily trying to reach you, I'm just trying to reach people like And the you. only Atlanta Falcons fan in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go, right? Like the, the, the fact that data is out there in the world means that I can find you. But even yeah. if it's not, if it's just like a, a regular name, like Robert Smith, fine. Robert Smith might be a, a super popular name around the world. How many of them are in the downtown core in Calgary, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot less than you would think. There's a lot more than you would want in your living room, but there's a lot less than you could think if you're trying to advertise to them. So reaching an audience is in a way it's easy, but you have to know exactly who you want to reach in order to craft that message. Yeah. The algorithm can be manipulated and it is, but not in the way that most people think it is. What do you think the biggest waste of time or, and money in marketing is? The biggest waste of money right now is Facebook ads. Facebook it's ads that are expensive. not targeted correctly. It's getting very expensive. Well, that's, and that's why, but it's because the targeting is off. I don't do paid advertising. It's not something that my uh, agency does. We have the ability to, I just did a, a very small ad for a client last month for an event, ran for two weeks. It was very short. And that's the first paid campaign that I've done in four years. The reason I don't do it is because it is very expensive for the client. And I don't like having the, being on the hook for immediate results, which is what advertising is supposed to be for. If you're not using it for brand building, which is just getting eyeballs on your page, or if you have a, like an actual thing that you want to sell, be it a couch or a course or a book, I don't like the idea of being told I have, you know, 10 grand, get me 500 sales, because I can't guarantee that no. based on the targeting that Facebook will allow me to do, mostly because they have this testing period of 14 days where they try and build an audience that they think will buy it. And if it doesn't, if that testing phase fails for whatever reason, they begin the process over again. And it begins with another 14 days and it just gets very expensive. Now, if you've targeted it correctly and you've done the work that I mentioned previously, where you know your why, you know what the goal is, 
and you know that there is an audience has this problem and reaches this persona, you can target very specifically with your Facebook ads, but you have to have that information first. The vast majority of clients and companies don't, they don't know who they're selling to. So Facebook becomes expensive because you have an idea for what you want, but you're pumping six grand into it instead of testing it over 30 days with a $5 minimum per day and then expanding it out that way. Mm -hmm. I think Facebook is the biggest waste of money. The biggest mistake people make is they're not asking their customers, like their existing customers, any questions. They're making a lot of assumptions as to why people buy. Marketing research is important. And I take at least three days a month to just for just research for my clients where it's just me sitting I'm not writing anything I'm not creating anything for a client every month I run all of my campaigns on a six week basis so for one day out of of those six weeks I just spend researching finding out whether or not there's actually an audience online reaching out to communities that exist on that there and just sort of looking through the content that they have on those communities and just researching. Then I'll take all of that research and I'll uh, write all of my notes down and I'll make my campaigns off that. When you look at conversations on advertising and whatnot, the corporate speak and social speak are two different vocabularies. This is where a lot of companies fail to reach their customer, for example, software companies. I've gone to websites and looked at every page and I still don't know what the hell they sell because it's all so technical. Who is their market? Like who is their customer? Is it, you don't even know if it's a corporation or they're trying to sell to the CEO, you know, dumb it down for most of us. <laughs> and, and a lot of, if they're B2B, software, then they're probably selling to an IT infrastructure person, either a CTO or someone on uh, the sales engineering team, someone who's buying stuff, right? I think with B2B, it's easier to get lost in the idea that you are selling to another company when you're not really, you're selling to the person who buys software for that company. So B2B is just B2C with extra steps. The, the thing that I always say is the pain points and the goal of B2B sales or marketing is different than B2C in that I have a problem as a customer that I want to solve. So for instance, with social media platforms, Hootsuite is what I use for some of my clients to schedule posts and stuff like that. If I was to work for a company doing it, or if I had someone working for me who was using Hootsuite and they needed to buy new licenses, their real goal is to not get fired. Basically, they don't want to get in trouble for spending money that they don't have on a piece of software that doesn't work. They don't want to get in trouble with their boss. They don't want to get fired. That is the ultimate goal. They just don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to waste their money and their time. You need to speak to that persona or that pain point. You need to say our integration is easy, which is to say that might sound a little bit corporate or a little bit technical, but the person who's buying that will know what it means because they have other systems in place that they have to speak to. You can say, Set it, getting the set, the setup is super easy. It'll work with all of your existing systems, et cetera, et cetera, down the line, sell, sell the, sell the idea that you're not going to get fired. If you buy from us, we have this guarantee that after 30 days, if you're really not happy, we could cancel the contract. Stuff like that helps when it comes to the sales copy, when it's B to C, you're talking business to consumer and trying to sell you software. That's where it gets a little bit engineering speak and it can become, it's almost like they haven't hired a B2C marketer. They've hired a B2B marketer to sell to customers. 
I see that qu happen quite a bit. The best way out of that is to just get people who've never heard of your company before and get them on the page and ask them to tell you what, what is being sold. If they can't tell you what's being sold, change your copy, hire a copywriter. Unless you get the techie guy doing that, then he's speaking the same language and they might as well be speaking Swahili. Yeah. And, or in Canada, French, like yeah. you know, even just French in, in having French software sales and uh, sales messages. It, some days I go to, for some reason, this is something that happens to me specifically. I get lumped to a Gatineau and I'm probably mm -hmm. butchering that pronunciate my French. Oh. I speak French with a Dublin accent. It's <laughs> awful. I did French for five years. You don't want to hear me speak French, but I get lumped into an IP address there, which means a lot of the websites that I get served by Google are in French. Oh, okay. Super frustrating. But if I can understand your website and it's in French, your messaging is super simple and I, I don't need to see it in English to know what I need. It's just about hiring a copywriter who will help you do that. Yeah. A lot of customers will balk at that. They'll, they'll think, well, why do I have to hire someone to do it? I can just write it myself. You're not going to write it in the way that your customers want it to. It's not an email to another business. It's you're speaking to Mary who is reading this on a phone on her way into work. She's got kids to take care of. She doesn't have time to try and parse out your business speak. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned something in a TikTok video about content becoming more commercialized on platforms, which stifles creativity. But on the other hand, even now with all the creativity we have, regardless of platform, you still have to be wary of copyright infringements. But I'd like you to expand on that a little bit because it, it was kind of an interesting talking point. This is something that specifically with TikTok, I brought this up because I started to notice and I brought this up a little bit earlier when I meant that, mentioned that undanced yeah. social influencer thing. When brands get involved, brand safety becomes a concern. You can't have your advertisement next to this came up in YouTube in 2012 next to an advertising for a uh, jihadist or the KKK, which happens on Facebook all the time. When that happens, when your brand gets served next to that content, it's a risk to your brand. You get associated with it and you don't want that brand safety becomes super important to the platform that you're posting on. The problem with brand safety is that it's bland. There's rules around it. We don't want our advertising appearing next to Planned Parenthood. We don't want it being appearing next to religious iconography. So you're not going to get the Joel Olson ads or Joel Olson content next to your ad about potato chips. There's so many little nuances that you need to make sure that your brand is as safe as possible. Unfortunately, safe is bland. The content that is created around that also has to adhere to that brand safety, which means the content is inherently less chaotic and less creative because chaos is creative. That is one of the reasons that TikTok became so popular. Yeah, There weren't a lot of brands on there. It was mostly people talking to other people. They could make content that wasn't getting the virality that you would have seen on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, all of the rest, because they had a more robust brand safety guideline. And that all stemmed from, we can go into history about it if you want, the adpocalypse on YouTube and why it happened. Well, that's kind of boring unless you're interested in marketing history, at least modern marketing history. The crux of the matter is, your brand has to be seen to be in a safe position so that you don't get in trouble as a brand. You don't want your brand appearing next to photos of the Twin Towers going down. You just don't. It's just one of those things. So when that happens, you have to be cognizant of both the creators that you're aligning yourself with because they could have some content in the past that is a little bit nail bitey unless you're willing to stand by that content and that creator, you need to like 
seriously research who you're doing your work with, as well as put a brand safety guideline in place so that, you know, if anything bad does happen, you can walk yourself back from it. Yeah. We spoke about hot takes on from Wendy's a little while ago. We've seen plenty of brands over the past maybe year and a half try and make that leap to Wendy's style content. It uh, doesn't go well. And then you travel back in the past and people are like, well, 15 years ago, you made an ad about a woman in a bikini. How progressive is that? That's terrible. The brand is like, well, okay, but it was a different time. It was 15 years. How different of a time was it? Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Just look at all the beer commercials from 20 years yeah. ago. <laughs> and that's one of the, one of the reasons that Budweiser is, I find Budweiser so popular from an advertising perspective is that while they did have some cringy ads, they had some great advertisements that yeah. were about puppies and horses and just general drink of beer. They have nothing to do with Budweiser whatsoever. It's like a lost dog and a massive horse. What's that could Although you can nothing. see the, the Clydesdales and the wagon at the Calgary Stampede, they do have it on display there. <laughs> right. But what has that got to do with beer in really? I well, you carry the I, barrels of beer in the back of the, the wagon. Did they? I think that's what, yeah, I think that's what it was. I did not know that, but there we go. Yeah. I've learned something new today. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in the display and at the Calgary Stampede, I do believe that there are actual wooden barrels of they're probably not full, but wooden barrels in the back of the, yeah. uh, the wagon. I got to go check that out because I love those <laughs> ads. Those Clydesdales, they're, they're probably, and they have nothing to do with beer. One's about a lost puppy. It's really sad. It's really satisfying. And then yeah. the other is about horses running in a field and you think, great. And I like the one where the life. horses are playing football in the field. And the yeah, exactly. Yes. Right? That's, <laughs> that's What's it got to do with beer? Nothing. But it, I yeah. know when I see those horses, I think Budweiser. Exactly. Which is a good, it's a good association to have. And that's what I mean by association and having to have brand safety. Horses One of the most football, ingenious great. tweets I've ever seen, and this goes back to watching the Super Bowl when they had the blackout for half an hour and it was the Niners the Niners playing who oh, the hell won the Super Bowl that year anyway that game there was a blackout and uh of course what's everybody doing they're on their phones killing time until the lights come back on so what did Oreo do they posted this picture of just a part of a cookie and it was on a black background and it says I've got it written down somewhere in the but dark you don't you yeah <laughs> genius that a tweet a free tweet probably got more eyeballs and more popularity than any paid ad on the super bowl days 100 <laughs> percent it did what most people don't realize is that that was a six-month project and they had wow. thousands of tweets they were only able to do that once they yeah. tried it again the next year and they weren't able to get the value for money. It no. was just one of those, it was one of those like serendipitous. We, we spent all of this money on creating and they created like thousands of tweets for what if this happens during the Super Bowl? Wow. What if this happens? That was just one of them. That is serendipitous and marketing gurus will pull out that as an example of okay. a brand going that extra mile or a brand being just on time with their messaging that wasn't impromptu that was 100 percent planned that's very cool because they could have used that tweet back in the 80s too when uh stanley cup final in boston when the oilers were there and the lights went out in the boston garden but that was way it's, before social media so they might yeah. want to hang on to that tweet because you never know what will happen in the future <laughs> and that is one thing that I do as well is I'll create, I'm sure as a writer, you do this to make notes or oh, yeah. come up with lines that you might want to use. I'll do that today. I was creating a case study for a client and it was about life insurance. And 
something else popped into my head, completely different product, completely different client. They're not even my client anymore. They've moved on, which is fine, but there's no guarantee in the future that I won't have a similar client and I can't pull this out and, you know, use it in, in part of my marketing. So having like a scrapbook or a Pinterest book or something of ideas mm -hmm. is always a good idea to have so that at least when it comes to creating your content, you'll have that pool to dip into. Yeah. Pinterest is great for hanging on to notes and refreshing yourself of ideas that, you know, on yeah. a private board or even a public board. So yeah, it's a great tool. I use it to keep track of the beers I drink. <laughs> it, it, it's still perceived as a mostly female social network and it yeah. shouldn't be. But as a designer, I ran a design firm for a long time. We used it a lot in our industry just as for like mood boards and stuff. And their trend analysis or their trend predictions are, they tend to be the best in the business. So mm -hmm. they release a report every January for what they expect will happen in the coming year, both Reddit and Pinterest are the best in the market on that. So wow. it's worth checking that out. Well, thank you so much, Dave. This was wonderful. The, I think that uh, people learned a lot about marketing and algorithms and how things work these days with uh, digital spaces. Thank you so much. I hope it, they find it useful 